So again, thanks people online. Thanks people for coming here. Um, if you don't know, this is part of the We uh, parentheses online user group. And I'm muting myself, and now folks online should be able to hear me. Yes. Awesome. Um, so I could kind of like rephrase what I just said for the last five minutes. So maybe let's, let me do that. Hope folks in the room are OK with that. Just want to be inclusive again. Um, so what I was just saying, telling the folks in the room <laughs> is like, um, so this is kind of like a talk that gives an update on a previous talk where we already showed how you can use VeeScope to visualize Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry is a platform as a service, a big distributed system. And sometimes you don't know what's going on in the system. The nice thing with Scope is you can use it to have the platform kind of like explaining itself and visualizing itself. So nobody has to be sitting there to like draw something like this, which I should actually go in presenter mode, to draw something like this. And what you are looking at here, that's actually Cloud Foundry. That was, is what it looks like. So each node in this graph, in this big graph, is an actual VM running in the cloud. Uh, and the edges between them are network connections, like active uh, network connections, traffic between those VMs. Um, so that's great. Um, and I told the folks in the room that this was already working. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, today is all about how to make it easier to deploy this thing. Because back then, um, what I showed you is there was a lot of hand-holding required and a lot of YAML that you had to write to deploy this thing, to deploy with scope to make it visualize Cloud Foundry, right? Um, and to do that, to, to write this YAML and to do this whole, uh, this whole like, procedure of like, deploying with Cloud, uh, with Scope, sorry, um, you had to know Bosch, um, which is the tool that we use to deploy things to the Cloud <laughs> in the Cloud Foundry context. Um, Bosch knows about manifests, about runtime configs, there's a CLI, and there's also a Bosch director. So lots of like, knowledge um, that is required to actually deploy and install like vScope for Cloud Foundry. Uh, there's more, right? You have to know about IS specifics. Like, for example, in this case, you have to know about like, what are the subnet IDs that you're using, so network-related stuff, related stuff. You have to know uh, VM types, like what, what they are called in like, each of the ISs, right? Like AWS calls VM types differently from GCP, for example. Um, so there's some IS specific stuff that you have to know. And then um, last, Certainly not least, and that's the, that's the, the most uh, important stuff here, is like the thing that you're deploying, this Bosch release, um, it's a tarball. But you cannot just deploy it if you don't know what's in there. You really have to know the inner workings of this release. You have to know, like, for example, that there is, in this case, like a scope app, and there's a bunch of agents that send reports to that app. So that's not transparent to you. You have to know that topology. You have to know certain properties, like, for example, you have to configure the agent to find the app to send a report to, right? So you have to know that. Uh, then you have to know about what's called the stem cell. So that's the operating system that's running on these VMs where you run your agents or the scope app, right? Um, you have to know, like, does this require a certain version of an operating system? I, I don't know, like Ubuntu 14.04 or bigger? Like, what version of the stem cell? Um, you might have to know about resource requirements, like, does the scope app uh, run with one CPU? Does it mul multiple CPU? What is the memory requirement? So lots of things. Um, don't even want to go into updates. Um, we we're just talking about updates and how tricky they can be. Like what version to what other version? Like do you support in the upgrade path? Um, are you supporting like rolling upgrades without downtime? Like how many canaries do you have? So lots of like knowledge that ideally the operator of such a system shouldn't have, right? Because um, I don't think that's scalable. Like, because there's lots of releases out there. And like, if you want to deploy them, there's lots of knowledge you would have to have. Um, but the good thing is, it's not a new problem. Right? There's like, lots of other releases out there, Bosch releases. And these are open source releases that are listed here that have the same problem. Right? Like, you download these releases somewhere, and then you're like, what am I going to do with these? Like, um, you have to come up with a magic YAML that kind of like, makes sense of them and deploys them using Bosch. Um, here are just a couple of examples. Um, actually, I have folks in the room that work on Rapid, so I'm going to point this one out. Um, that by itself probably doesn't even buy you that much because there's other releases that you have to co-locate with this one to make it into like, something that's digestible. Um, the biggest uh, release that I would guess that you would find out there right now is the CF release. Uh, that's Cloud Foundry as a release. Um, 
don't even know how big that tarball is. So all these releases are tarballs. Um, but it's really hard to configure. Um, you can do it, but it's a steep learning curve, and it will take you some time. Um, good thing is, this is not a new problem, and there are solutions out there. For example, you could choose not to operate this at all and use like a, a hosted Cloud Foundry, like for example, Pivotal Web Services um, or um, IBM Bluemix, right? Um, but if you wanted to operate this, um, you could go with what Pivotal offers you, which is Pivotal Ops Manager. So what is Pivotal Ops Manager? It's basically like, think of it like as an AMI or like a virtual machine image that bundles two things. Um, one is a web application. It's a Ruby and Rails application. And the other thing is a Bosch director. So if you install this image, you will get two things, this application and a Bosch director in the cloud of your choice. So right now, we support like GCP, Google Cloud Platform, AWS, Azure, and a couple of others, vSphere. Um, what, what is this thing for? Why, why do you need this web app? Well, you can use it uh, to deploy and manage a variety of products. And the most important one right now, I would, I would say, is like Pivotal Cloud Foundry, which is also referred to as Pivotal Elastic Runtime. And that's basically. Think of it as a distribution of Cloud Foundry, of open source Cloud Foundry, that kind of like just works. And it works in a way that offers you HA and like lots of other nice things like centralized logging, et cetera. Um, these products that you install with Ops Manager, they're often called tiles. And why is that? Because if you look at Ops Manager, and here's a picture, uh, in the web app, you will see these products as these kind of like I don't know, squares or like rectangles right, in the UI. And that's why we call them tiles. Looks a little bit like a tile, I guess. Um, usually, you would, you would see at least one tile. It's the first one. That's the director, the Bosch director that comes with option, Ops Manager. So in this example, for the screenshot, it's uh, running on vSphere. So the director would be a vSphere director. Um, then for this example, you, what you would have, as I mentioned before, Pivotal Elastic Runtime, so a Cloud Foundry. And then this also has RabbitMQ and MySQL. So these are service brokers that give you instances of whatever they say, so data services. Get an instance of RabbitMQ or get an instance of MySQL to use with the apps that you push onto Cloud Foundry. So that's Ops Manager. And the idea is like you like download these tiles, you upload them to your Ops Manager in your cloud, you uh, configure them inside the UI, it press apply changes, and all of this works. So you don't really write any YAML. Sounds nice. Could be nice, um, um, but there's a lot of it, uh, lot of like wiring happening. So what's what's inside the tile? What's the tile about? Well, it's basically a tarball, and usually that tarball contains releases, at least one, sometimes multiple. Now there are also tiles out there that don't contain any Bosch releases, but let's not go into them today. Let's assume there's at least one Bosch release. Then there's a Bosch manifest template, and this is in important that this is a template. This is not like a pre-made manifest that is static. So this is a, a manifest that has certain placeholders in it, which are used for like configurable properties. And these properties, um, you can configure them in that UI, in that Rails app. And to do that, the, the tarball, the tile, actually has a definition for these UI elements in it. So it's another YAML file, basically. But you, as a user, wouldn't see it. right? Um, the idea is that you go to network.pivotal.io, you download Ops Manager, and then you also download the tiles there. Think of it like kind of like as the Pivotal. Cloud Foundry App Store, so to say. You download all that stuff there, you install it, um, and you should be go good to go. Now, back to WeScope and WeFWorks and what this talk is really about. Um, Luke and I, and I think I mentioned that before, I'm not sure the folks online got it. Luke uh, used to work at, uh, at WeFWorks, and him and me, um, we worked on like a tile for WeFWorks, so a tile that kind of like wraps up scope, but also another piece, which we, I will get into a little bit, and makes it easy to install. Please? Yeah. Uh, just, just a question. If you've got these tiles, I'm wondering if it's possible for a customer to extend the control interface, and if so, what the underlying UI technology is. OK. Uh, OK. So that was a question. There was a question in the, in the room uh, about like Ops Manager and how does that actually work? Can you extend the UI and like what's the technology behind the curtain? Like how do we do this? Um, that's not much of an extension that you can do. And I don't know when you say customer, like when you're asking for a customer to extend that, I don't know what customer you have in mind. Is that an operator? Or? So for example, somebody who has multiple different other systems in place other than control 
okay, somebody who has other systems in place other than Pivotal <coughs> Cloud Foundry. Um, so no, there's, there's not really a way to extend that. Um, internally, it's kind of proprietary, like the way this works internally. That's not like some sort of standard that we use. Um, so if you build these cards, you better know this proprietary standard. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, so Luke and I, we wrote a tile that makes it easy to install scope. And this is what the rest of this talk is about. Um, before we go into a demo, and I think that's the in interesting piece, that's hopefully why some of you came, let's um, talk about what the tile will actually deploy and the architecture behind, the architecture behind like, what it will deploy. Because there's basically two options here. You can deploy a standalone scope app that will collect all these reports from your Cloud Foundry and will visualize them. Or you can integrate with Weave Cloud, which um, we can talk about later, and actually, I think Ilya is going to show a little bit about Weave Cloud. Um, so that you can explore and monitor your Cloud Foundry solution from within your account at WeaveWorks or WeaveCloud. Um, so let's take a look at these um, two architectures really quick. Um, first, standalone. Like, what does that mode look like? So we start out with like a green cloud, which we want to say is like that's where your PCF stuff runs. So this is like your PCF ops manager environment running in one of the well-known ISs, right? So in there, because you installed Ops Manager, you already got a Bosch Director for free uh, with Ops Manager. And because you installed the ERT tile, the Cloud Foundry tile, you also now have a bunch of VMs. One of them is a Cloud Controller, so-called Cloud Controller. Think of it like one of the more important or like most important like pieces of Cloud Foundry. Um, and then there's like lots of other VMs, right? Like we saw that picture earlier, like 20 to 30 VMs. You can expect like out of the box for not such a big environment. Um, so all of this you get with Ops Manager, just installing Ops Manager and the ERT tile, right? So now you install the WeaveWorks tile. Um, first thing that happens if you configure standalone mode, you get one or multiple VMs, up to you how many you want, um, of the scope app, right? And that's that web app that shows you that graph. Um, next thing the tile is going to do when you install it, it's going to co-locate, and I'm not sure you can see that, these little boxes onto the Cloud Foundry VMs. So these are the agents. Like we're going, we are going to use Bosch Runtime Config to co-locate them so that they then send reports to the scope app. And once you have that, you can just go to that scope app and like see your deployment, your Cloud Foundry deployment. Um, I will demo that in a little bit. There's a little bit of an integration happening so that you have easy access to the scope app. You don't have to jump through loops to actually access it. And also like so that it's secure, so that not everyone on the internet can see your platform and see all the secrets in there, right? Uh, but I will show that in a little bit. So that's standalone. Um, now, how is this different from Weave Cloud integration? So Weave Cloud, again, we start out with our PCF deployment, Bosch Director, um, C Cloud Foundry deployed, so you have a bunch of VMs there. Um, first thing here to know is there's another thing. There's another cloud. It's called Weave Cloud. It's not really a cloud. It's a service um, or software as a service offering that the, the folks at WeaveWorks offer. Uh, what does that give you? It gives you like the tools like Scope, but also other tools like um, at Prometheus that you can use to monitor, explore, and um, yeah, like kind of like um, integrate with a cluster or a distributed system that you have uh, it, that you run somewhere else, right? So here, the idea is that. There's a component in Weave, in Weave Cloud that's called Explore, and that's basically a scope app. Think of it like a scope app. It's a highly available, scalable scope app. Um, it also has like one nice feature I will refer to um, Ilya. I think he's talking about that later, called time travel. You don't get it with the standalone app right now, but you get it if you integrate with WeaveWorks, uh, with the Weave Cloud. OK, so the idea here is that you would use that um, offering, their offering, and you would log into your Weave Cloud account and you would see your PCF deployment in there, right? So how do we get that working? Well, um, same thing, right? Like we're going to co-locate, the tile is going to co-locate the agents onto all of our VMs over on the left side. But instead of like also deploying a scope app in that green cloud, we're just like configuring the agent so that the agent sends reports straight to Weave Cloud, right? Uh, you use that, you do that with like um, a service token, uh, but I can show you that later. So at this point, you will be able to see, like in Weave Cloud, your CF deployment, which runs somewhere completely different, which is quite nice. Uh, now, one more thing for like the Weave Cloud integration, which makes it different from the standalone um, option. There's another component um, 
think out of like three or four components inside Weave Cloud. It's called Monitor. And what that is, it's basically a um, highly avail available Prometheus deployment. I think you call it Cortex. Um, so it's scalable, highly available, and um, like you don't have to set up anything. It just runs there. And you can use that to actually monitor whatever you are monitoring, right? like your Kubernetes cluster, or in this case, Cloud Foundry. Uh, and this is, talks more about like metrics and actually querying metrics, because that's what this allows you, is like writing queries ad hoc, like using PromQL. And I will show you that in a little bit. So Luke and I thought, like, how hard would it be to actually get Cloud Foundry and Bosch metrics over to the right side into Weave Cloud? Uh, turns out it's not that hard. All the tile had to do is like spin up a Prometheus instance inside the Green Cloud on the left side, inside our PCF environment. Um, have that Prometheus instance scrape two APIs. One is the Bosch Director API, so we know what kind of deployments are in that cloud. How are the Bosch workers um, looking like? Kind of monitoring like the underlying Bosch um, layer. And then also we are going to scrape the Cloud Control API to learn more about what's going on inside Cloud Foundry. How many apps do we have deployed? Um, like, are there any errors on, in, in the apps and that kind of stuff? What, what's the workload? Uh, and then once this, this VM, this Prometheus VM, scraped all of this, um, it's going to send it straight into Weave, Weave Cloud. Um, so it's kind of like just a forewarner, so to say. And then you should be able to see the metrics in there. Um, and that's what the demo is about. So um, how am I doing in terms of time? I'm OK? Cool. So let me show a little bit of a demo. So what are we looking at here? Uh, let me just minimize this. Get most of the stuff out of the way. Can I move this? Yeah. Cool. So here we are looking at one ops manager environment. Um, so that's the first one. I'm going to have three tonight. This is the first one. It's called Jive. Uh, somebody came up with that. Um, I already imported the WeaveWorks tile into this. Um, it's actually quite easy. Like if you look at my, I'm sure you can see that. If you look at my screen here, this is a local folder. And in there, I have a Weave Cloud 001 alpha one dot pivotal file. And that's that tarball I was mentioning. That's the tile. I actually built that locally here. In the future, hopefully, you will be able to download this um, from PivNet at some point. So you upload this thing. It's very easy. You just like track it over here, drop it in there, and then it will upload. Right now, this thing is 900 max, roughly, because there's lots of releases in there. So I wanted to spare you that upload time. Instead, I already imported it. Once it's imported, you will see this on the left side here. You can click the little plus sign. Did I click it? And then you wait for just a few seconds. And there it is. I actually clicked it twice. That's why there's an error message. It said like it was already there. Sorry for that. Um, also, to explain to people online, it looks like you're sharing just your browser instead of your oh. desktop. So they didn't see your little window. So just so oh, you sorry. A file. Yeah. Sorry for that. Yes, I'm only sharing my browser right now. I should have remembered. Um, I should probably switch that because I'm going to share more in a little bit. So hopefully now you see my desktop. I will show you the local file, which was this one. All I did is was throw this over here, basically. OK, which I now dropped it in the wrong place. But forget about it. All right, so now I added this tile. What you will see first thing is it's, it's not green. It's orange because, well, there's like stuff for you to figure out before you can install it. On the right side, this Apply Changes button, that's the button you click to install stuff, to deploy stuff. Right now, it's grayed out, so it's not inactive because there are things for you to configure. So let's take a look what's there to configure. So you click on the tile, and what you will get is like a bunch of tabs here on the left and some tabs on the top here too. But the important ones are the settings here. Uh, one of them is orange, and it's called Assign ACs, Availability Zones, and Networks. And that's really all that we have to figure, fill, fill out here. We have to say, like, uh, whatever VMs this thing deploys, what, where do we want to put them? So if there's a singleton VM, which like, of our availability zones do we want to put it in? So this is GCP. Let's say we want to keep it in Europe West B, the B zone. right? And let's balance all the other jobs. If they're like multiple, it's not a single one. Let's balance them across all three ACs that we have in that um, GCP zone. Then we only have to choose a network. And that's a network that's, um, that's managed by Ops Manager. So you don't have to know like, any subnet IDs or anything. Um, so we choose, like, for example, the one that ERT, Elastic Runtime, uses for its VMs. And that will be used. So our scope app will be in the same network. Then you just say save. Um, 
everything is green, jobs were updated, you can go back to your installation dashboard, and you can see now that the button is not inactive anymore, and you can click it. Um, that will take a couple seconds, and then you should see a screen that you will be looking at for about an hour, and that will like install like scope and like co-locate the agents. Um, but I want to spare that for you. I don't want to have you waiting here. So I have an, another ops manager where I open the lock so that I can show you what actually happened, right? Like after you click that button. Um, so as you see, like I did this in August, sometime in August, about a month ago. Uh, and as I mentioned, it takes about an hour, so in this case, 15 minutes to deploy this thing. Um, there's a bunch of steps here on the left. I don't know if you can see that in the room. There's two important steps, really. One is called installing WeaveWorks. What that did is really just installing the scope app as a VM, right? Bringing this up. Um, sorry, I shouldn't have done that. Um, scroll back up to the, so you see like how big the locks are, right? Like it's quite a bit of things happening behind the curtain. Um, so installing WeaveWorks, that installs the app. And then there's one more step after that. It's, it's called running errand install scope probe for WeaveWorks. Um, so that task will actually co-locate the agent to Cloud Foundry, right? And at that point, you're basically done. The installation happened. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So here, yet another ops manager environment. This one's called CADAC. Um, here, we already installed this thing, right? So it's done. Installation happened. So let's click on the tile first to see like, how we configured it, um, because that's interesting. Um, click on it, wait a little bit. So that's that networking thing that you already saw. That's not super in, in, uh, interesting. The interesting tab here is called Weave Cloud on the left. There's only one box in there, and that's called Weave Cloud Service Token. As you see, for this service, uh, for this ops manager environment, that's left empty. What that means is we are not going to export or send any reports or metrics to Weave Cloud. So this is a standalone mode. And in fact, if you go to the resource config, yet another tab where you can configure how many VMs you want to have of each type, you will see that we will have one Weave Scope app here. So one VM, that's the little one here. And that's the default setting. Uh, and then this Prometheus forwarder that I mentioned earlier, we scaled it down to zero, because in this case, we don't need it. Because we don't have a service token, there's no metrics to be sent anywhere anyway. Um, so that's what this looks like. And let me just open another browser window. So this is um, an anonymous window. I wanted to do that because I wanted to show you what it looks like if you don't have um, cookies and, and session data. Uh, and what I, what I want to do here is I want to go to my scope app on this environment. So Katak is the environment. And when you install the tile in standalone mode, it will configure this route for you. There will always be a scope dot somewhere. And that somewhere is the system domain of this ops manager environment. So that was already given. So we basically, the tile registered this route for you. Once you open that, um, what should have happened is you should have logged into this. Um, let me just see if I'm actually having another. Yeah, so I had this window already open, so that was session data. Let me do this again. So I'm going to open another anonymous browser here. I'm going to the scope CADAC again. And this time, you see, like, now there was no session data, and I'm actually getting a login screen. And that's, this is because the tile that we wrote integrates the scope app with uh, what is called UAA the user authentication and authorization component of Cloud Foundry. So now here, you have to actually log in, because you really don't want this to be public necessarily, right? Because people could get information that is kind of sensitive, like what apps have you running? What does the platform look like? Um, so let's, let's log in. Um, I don't remember the, the passwords, um, but we should be able to find it real quick. If we go CADAC CF admin. And that already tells you that you have to be a certain admin to actually access that. So there are multiple like scopes within the, um, the authorization, authorization component or context within Cloud Foundry. To access this scope app, you have to be Cloud Foundry admin. And the reason we chose that scope, so this is off, the reason we chose that scope is um, because you get access to quite a bit of information. And yeah, I think only admins should have that access, right? First thing you see here is like the platform, I'm not going to go into the the, the specifics, but that's what it looks like. This is like your Cloud Foundry platform. And then you will also see like what containers, what apps are running on the platform. Um, again, I'm not going to go into the details for this right now. A little bit more on that later. But um, so yeah, 
you, what you see here basically it works, right? Standalone mode, you get a, get a route, everything is like nice and secure, more or less. Um, and yeah, it works out of the box. You just click a bunch of buttons and it's a, it's a relatively nice user experience. All right, cool. Um, so that's standalone mode. Let's take a quick look at the other mode uh, because that's also quite interesting. That's the Reef cloud integration. So yet another environment here. This one is called Roam, so third environment. Uh, let's take a look at the style and how it is configured first. Again, it has been installed in this one already. Um, the interesting one here is the Reef Cloud tab again. And here you see that there's something filled out. So this is where we put uh, the Reef Cloud service to. And you get this token as soon as you sign up to Reef Cloud, which we will look at in just a second. You get this token, and that token identifies your account on their platform, right? so that you are not sending your metrics and your reports to the wrong user. Use your token. But they're kind of cryptic anyway, so you'd be hard pressed to actually guess them. Uh, cool. Um, so the token is configured here. That thing has been deployed with this token. Let's take a quick look at the resource config. Um, you see, in this case, we don't have any scope app scaled down to zero. But instead, we scaled, scaled the Prometheus forwarder up to one. So we now have this forwarder that I mentioned earlier. All right, so how does this look like? So in this case, there's no scope dot, or what is it, roam, whatever route, because there's no scope app on this environment. Instead, you would look in, log in into your Reef Cloud account, and that's what it looks like. So this is like on cloud.reef.works. And you basically have these four tabs there, like network, deploy, explore, and monitor. Like this tile cares mostly about the last two tabs, or basically only right now. So the explore tab and the monitor tab. Explore is basically what scope app is, right? So let's click on that. And what we should see here is um, our CF deployment. And here it is. So this looks pretty similar. It's maybe rendered a little bit. It's not as wide as the other one, but it's basically the same. Um, so this is pretty cool, because now like this cloud.weave.works, I think, runs on AWS. But what we see here is a GCP environment. And the cool thing that I can show you, like if you click one, on to one of their nodes, you see like this node, it's an etcd TLS server, apparently. That's what it's called. It talks to a couple of other etcd TLS servers and a couple more components, a console server, amongst others. Um, so that's what you see here. And you can do this cool thing where you click a button, and all of a sudden, um, I'm not sure you can see that. Let me just make this bigger. You are like on this machine. So, so you used like a scope app that runs in their cloud in AWS. And you have remote access to a VM that runs in GCP. And all of that works without any crazy network tunneling. Uh, that's the power of WebSockets, actually. That's how it's implemented. Uh, and just to prove you that this is actually true, um, you can use like Monet Summary, for example. Everyone who knows Bosch knows Monet. And we see that, yeah, this is actually um, a TLS server. It has a console agent. That's probably the one that talks to the server, by the way. It runs a couple of other things, amongst others, the scope probe, which is a scope agent. That's the one that actually opens up this, this tunnel for us, this web socket. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's like the Explore tab. And why we are in the Explore tab, um, let me show you one more thing, because that also changed since the last time I showed this stuff. Um, so this is the platform. These are the hosts, the VMs, right, that make up the platform. Let's look at the containers. Uh, when we say containers in Cloud Foundry land, what this really means is like these are apps, apps that have been pushed to the platform, right? And they show up here also as nodes. So last time, what you saw is like lots of like nodes, but they weren't connected. Now you see like some of these nodes are actually connected. Um, so what we're showing here is like actually container networking, which was a feature that was introduced to Pivotal Cloud Foundry with the last version officially. So now containers can talk to each other directly. Before that, they would have to go out to the internet and go through the, what's called the Cloud Foundry router. Um, but now we see these connections here, and um, Scope is perfectly able to like, show them. Um, and just to prove you that, like, I have a little like, what tries to like, resemble some sort of microservice um, app here. We have a backend service, I have a proxy, and I have a registry. I don't know if you can see that. Let me see if I can zoom in here. So yeah, so here you see like the back end. There's a sewer proxy, which is like a Netflix thing. Um, there's a registry here. That registry is actually a Eureka that, uh, registry, so also a Netflix um, component. Uh, the reason that is like all Netflix stuff is because like this uh, microservice app here uses actually Spring uh, Cloud services. 
which is based on Netflix components. Um, and let me just go to a different browser window. Yeah, this one. So I don't know if you can see that. Let me make it bigger. So what it says in the, in the, in the address bar here, it says frontend.apps.roam. So this is an app running on this environment. It's the front end. And once I hit this, what this is doing, it's going to talk to the, um, the registry to find out where the backend is and talk then to the backend. So let me just like do a couple of these requests. But you already see in the background here that there's a new edge that appeared. The front end now talks to the registry. And then in a little bit, um, you should actually see it talking to the back end. Let me just go back here and do a couple more refreshes. So, yeah, and you see, like, that now there's, a, there's an edge between the front end and the back end. I don't know if you can see that, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, that's container networking, also working with Scobat. Pretty cool. Um, this is really nice. Like, let's say you have like a very complicated microservice app to actually show the like, topology behind it. Um, what else is there to show? Um, yeah, please. I'm to risk turning on my mic. Could you reiterate? Reiterate, uh, reiterate what you said again. What okay. Value. Right. Sure. Um, so Cloud Foundry, like Kubernetes is a container platform, right? Like your main, let's say, currency is a container. And you, you uh, push a container to the app, and the scheduler is going to like, bring it up and keep it up, right? Like when it dies, like, it brings it up again. And you can scale it. So container is like the, the, the currency there, like the, the, the unit, right? Uh, Cloud Foundry is like an application, like a pass. Um, so the application is the unit of, that we care about. We don't care about containers necessarily. Now, behind the curtain, all these apps, so, so basically you, you just want to push an app. You don't want to like wrap it in the container first yourself just to push it. That's what the platform gives you for free, right? So behind the curtain, Cloud Foundry is going to take your app code, your application code. It's going to compile it. Uh, and then builds a container. And we are using garden containers, which is not Docker, but different. And that's what you see in this, in this um, view here. It's actually the containers behind applications, right? So if you actually, um, so this is like just the container view. If you um, kind of aggregate these containers by image name, what you will see here is like, these are the apps. And you will see some of these apps like, there's one app here, which is called Apps Manager JS. So apparently, like a JavaScript app. But, um, you see, like six containers. What that means is like that we have six application instances of that app run. So yeah, that's like an app in Cloud Foundry. Behind the curtain is a container. The difference to something like Kubernetes is you don't care how this container gets built. It's, it's done for you. Um, so yeah, um, that's that. So now this is this whole explore thing. Um, just want to quickly show to you like the other tab, the monitor tab, which is all about metrics. Before, before we leave this screen, uh, I noticed at the bottom of the screen you can see that uh, a couple of plugins are installed. Oh, There's yeah. a Bosch plugin and a, yeah. a Garden plugin. Is that something you wrote? Yeah. Um, so scope is like nicely extendable. Like allows you to write plugins, um, and these plugins. They, um, they run alongside the um, agent, like on like whatever you're monitoring, whatever host that is. And in this case, uh, we wrote two plugins. One is uh, called Bosch. And as the name suggests, that gives you like, some information about Bosch. So if you go back, let me just right, go back to like 100%, use this let's zoom here. You go back to the platform, to the host view, right, take a look at one of these hosts. Go back to let's go to this one, Doppler. It's called Doppler. You get see some statistics here. You get that out of the box of scope. What you don't get out of the box here's some networking. You get out of the box processes. But down here you see some additional data. This is like Bosch data that tells you a little bit more. Like what's this? What's this job about? Like this job is part of a deployment, a Bosch deployment called CF, some unique identifier. Um, it has index zero. So if there are multiple of these VMs, you would see different indexes. There's certain Bosch networking settings. So that's what this plugin, this Bosch plugin, gives you. It extracts information from the VM. It presents them in the scope app about Bosch. Right? The other plugin we have, and for that one, we should take a look at one specific node in here, which is called the cell. So to find that node, you could look, or we use um, actually the search in here. So let's use the search and maybe go over to table so we see it easier. So this is like the non craft view, it's a table view. So here's the Tiego cell. That's what this thing is called. And that's um, a VM where we run these containers on. 
So that's like the, the host for the containers. So let's take a look at that. Um, so again, like you get like all the vitals for free, like a little bit of information about the operating system on this VM, inbound, outbound connections. But what's new here and what's specific about this VM, it's this containers view. And I don't know if you can see that. Let me try to make it bigger. It's called containers here, right? And you see containers that kind of resemble admins. And that's what the garden plugin gives us. Like the garden plugin runs on this VM. It queries the garden uh, API to find out what containers are running on this node and you know, what, what's specific about them. So if you now click on the container, you will see some information about that particular container. Um, some vitals again, a um, little bit of information about the um, networking, what IP, host IP, container IP. Um, a little bit more about like Cloud Foundry specific things, like what app does this container belong to? So unfortunately, here you get only the app group, not the name, um, and other stuff. So that's what these plugins are about. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, and just wanted to hear about uh, your experience in implementing these plugins. Did it take you long to implement this? Um, so when we implemented them, that was like end of last year. Now that was like during the hack day. Um, okay. So I think back then, you guys did not have the documentations you have nowadays. Okay. So I would totally think like nowadays it would take less time. But even back then, we were able to do, come up with a rough version within a day. Right? Oh, really? Two plugins, two people, two plugins, uh, one day. Cool. Yeah. I'm um, sure the convention hasn't broken yet. I've published a few, few example plugins more recently, exactly. uh, such as the one for traffic. Right, cool. Um, so yeah, that, that's what you get here. Um, let me like tease one one little feature, and Ilya is going to show you more about it. It's this time travel thing, which is pretty cool. Um, let me actually go back to the graph view. Um, you, you see, like the front end does not talk right now to any the back end or anything here. Let's see if we can scroll back in time to see it talk um, to these other nodes. Um, I definitely did it earlier today, so let's maybe go a little bit back around, like maybe the afternoon somewhere around here. So at least something changed. We still don't see the front end talk to something. But you get the point. You basically now can scroll in time and see what happened at a certain point in time. But Ilya is going to cover that into more detail. That's what you get also with Leafworks integration. You wouldn't get that with the standalone app. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see where we are, because I think we're almost done with this. Um, so that was the demo. Uh, we talked a little bit about plugins. I showed you the different modes. Um, might be wondering what's next on the roadmap. Um, and so if anyone has that question, like, will this thing ever end up on PiffNet? Can I install it? Um, so I think there's like talks going on, like people working between WeaveWorks and Pivotal with the partnership team at Pivotal to actually get this onto PiffNet so that we can try it out. Um, did, did you want to show some of the Prometheus stuff? Oh, did I not show that? Sorry. Yeah, Sorry, because, uh, because you asked question. me about, um, yeah, totally. You read me there, but totally. Uh, monitoring. Um, let's look on the monitoring tab. Um, that's my, let's go back to 100%. Um, so this is what the monitoring tab looks like. It's not that exciting when you first go into it, right? Like you see like a little box here where you can apparently like type some sort of queries. PromQL is a standard that comes, like if you know Prometheus, you might know that uh, query language. Um, this allows you to actually do like queries across your metrics, the metrics that are stored within Prometheus. Now, you can create so-called notebooks, where you like have a compilation of like, um, like queries that you wrote before. And I actually created two here. Like one is Cloud Foundry. So what you see here is like just a number of app instances. So I haven't changed that in a while. Um, maybe we can go back a little bit. At some point today, I scaled some apps. I don't know how far I can get back. So, can you show that as a table? I can click on the spark lines. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's see if we can do that. Explore. OK. Container view. And what do I do? OK. Uh, uh, one of those. Oh, OK. Uh, okay. No, um, OK. So that might not quite work yet with Cloud Foundry. Because there's probably like some integration work to do. I guess this works out of the box with Kubernetes. Yeah. We need a plugin for that. We need a plugin for that. Yeah. <laughs> but you can still write these queries, which is quite nice. Uh, let's go back to monitor. Let's show you a couple more queries. So that's Cloud Foundry. You can like query like what what are 
what are the application instances I have. So here what you see is like, you go to table, one as table, you see the same kind of thing that we saw earlier, but this time it's metrics, not scope, uh, that tells us that this apps manager JS is the application <coughs> name here. Oops, how did I make this? Oh, I see. Like I clicked on it, and then the query changes. Uh, OK. So what, what you see here is the value is 6. So like telling you the same thing that we saw in the other view, there are six instances of this app right now on the platform. Um, you might be interested in like, hey, what's the, um, the total, um, total memory that a particular app uses across all instances? Um, so you could just look at CF application memory in megabyte, multiply that by CF application instances. That's what would give you that. Um, so here you see like the one that uses the most, which is two gigs, is actually this Pivotal account app, which comes out of the box. Um, interestingly enough, I think that only has one instance, but it uses quite a bit of memory. Maybe there are two instances. So it uses actually more than what Apps Manager uses across like six instances. Quite interesting. Doesn't make sense. That's a JavaScript app. It probably does most of the, uh, the processing on the client side. Um, so yeah, this is like CF-related metrics. And then there's another um, notebook here called Bosch that tells you a bit more about the platform, Bosch. Um, so what is the first one here that I, and honestly, I created them randomly, right? Like I'm not really, I'm not operating um, any of these platforms, so I don't really know what to look for right now. I would have to dig a little bit deeper, so I just created some random queries. Um, so here, what I do, I want to see like what's the total CPU um, that's being used by um, Bosch uh, job name, so which Bosch job uses what CPU time, right? Um, so I'm summing up um, a user on a system CPU, and I prove it by the Bosch job name. So you see that this query language gives you like some some proving, like aggregation and that kind of stuff. Uh, what do I see here is like you see this graph. If we look at the table, what's the big one here? It's um, yeah, apparently this etcd TLS server. Probably when I clicked it around in it. Um, and I might have caused some load. Um, but the interesting one is that the Chico cell, and that's what I would expect, is probably usually quite, up, quite high up there. So these are the VMs that we deployed with Bosch, and like how much CPU are they using right now. And there are a bunch of other um, you know, like, um, queries that I typed up here. But again, like it's really easy for you yourself to type things. This has actually like auto-completion, like if I went in here and said, CF application, what do I have in there? OK, I have like tons of like stuff. Um, I could see, like, did I have any scrape errors? Did Prometheus not, was Prometheus not able to like, get my metrics and that kind of stuff? So yeah, that's, that's what metrics looks like. And again, the, the point here is that you are querying this stuff in a different environment than from where this actually comes. It's quite cool. All right, I feel like talked a lot, and I went way over time, but I'm sorry. Um, if you're interested in looking at this tile at all, um, here's a, a Git repo, WeaveWorks Experiments, with a dash P weave, um, that will show you what this tile looks like behind the curtain. It's basically a lot of YAML. There's uh, some instructions in there how to build it. Um, you can use Docker to build it. It's quite easy. And then you should be able to use it. But again, like the typical warning, like this is not yet production quality. So please don't go out, install that at any like production environment where you really care about like security and privacy and that kind of stuff. Thank you. Hey folks. Uh, everyone here in the room and uh, folks online. Good evening and uh, good day to wherever you are. Um, I'm Ilya from VWorks, and uh, I'm going to show you a little more of the um, latest features we've got in vCloud. It's going to be a short talk. I don't want to keep you here for too long. Um, so let me share my screen. So I've been working on a, um, on a demo for a talk tomorrow. And it's, it's still a work in progress, so I can't show you much of what I've been doing there. Um, but the talk is, um, it, it is about Kubernetes and TensorFlow. TensorFlow is pretty cool, right? You all heard of TensorFlow? It's a machine intelligence framework from Google, just as hard as Kubernetes. 
Damn it. Okay, so I've been doing some of that. I'm trying to figure out how things work, right? So I've been given a bunch of Kubernetes manifests that I got to deploy to my cluster and, um, and try to <laughs> make some sense of it in like a couple of days' time. What, what do I use for that? Well, obviously, I'm going to use Leave Cloud, right? I'm going to use Leave Cloud to, to deploy the manifests. I check them into a Git repo, and I use vCloud Deploy, which I'll show you in a, minute, in a moment, and I use vCloud Explorer to, to, to see what, what the hell's going on. Um, I'm just barely figuring this stuff out, really. So, um, so I've created a, a, a cluster in GKE, and I can do like kubectl cluster info, and um, yeah, it shows me like a cluster is running up there. Um, I only got one node, yep. And um, at the moment, I haven't deployed any parts. So um, if I look at like all namespaces, it might have some more. There should be some pods. Yeah, cool. I actually do have some pods, but only the ones that um, Google con uh, Container Engine gives me, and uh, the, the ones for vCloud agents. To save the time installing vCloud agents, it's really quite quick, but uh, I just wanted to keep it really short. Um, I've installed them already. So if I, if I go to vCloud Explore, uh, look at the system name space, I'll, I'll find all those folks that I, I just saw on the command line, right? And um, this is all quite, um, quite simple here. Got a bunch of pods for, for vCloud, got like a Fluent GCP, Keepster, kubeDNS, uh, DNS Autoscaler, Kubernetes dashboard, some other bits and bobs. Um, uh, Codex node export, the Prometheus node exporter is there as well. And um, as we said earlier, we've, we've added feature recently, which um, which basically can allows you to, to go from, from the um, uh, explore view to the monitor view and uh, figure out the exact metrics there. So um, here's that feature in action. Essentially, we can flip back and forth. Um, we can look at memory as well and learn uh, PromQL that way. So to, 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 find, um, to find the uh, memory usage of a particular uh, container in a Kubernetes cluster, you can specify uh, a metric like this. So essentially, uh, a PromQL query like this, which includes a sum on the metric with a label selector where a pod name matches something that begins with vcortex node exporter dash and then um, some other characters and it, it is a namespace cube system. So here, here is the total memory usage of, of node exporter and uh, we can find more low level Kubernetes metrics over here and learn some of the more advanced from QL lines here. Uh, and uh, also in node resources, you would find stuff that comes from the node exporter. Node exporter is something that you would run as a daemon set in your Kubernetes cluster, and it will go and collect this usage network stats, etc. cetera. Uh, so yeah, and I mean, I don't have any apps here yet. I haven't got any app metrics to look at, but if you've had some, let's imagine we did, and we, Suppose we, uh, we care about some app that, that exposes an HTTP, uh, a set of HTTP kind of metrics, right? So, um, so let's say you have the HTTP request duration in microseconds. You look at it as a table, you find uh, a lot of different things, and uh, the ones that are gray, grayed out, we haven't seen those in a while, and the ones that are bold, we, we can look at, they have current values available. So if you can, can go and select some of these, for example, for a, a component API server, we can see uh, durations of HTTP requests as they come into the Kubernetes API server. That's like literally like me typing kubectl get pod here, right? So these are the stats from Kubernetes internals. If you, if you had the, a job of your own, you'd usually use something like job namespace slash, um, um, I don't know, my app, right? So, but they, I mean, this doesn't return anything right now. 
but that that's what you would normally use if if you if you had a job of your own that that you cared about and it exposed the HTTP type metrics. So go back and explore. We said we've introduced time travel, and I'll show you a little bit more of that. And I'm also going to show you deploy, uh, which should be quite fun. So what I'm going to do is essentially go back to uh, unselect cube system namespace, look at my default namespace. Not much is happening here, right? So let's make something happen. I've got a bunch of manifests here lying around in a, in a, in a Git repository. But there, there's a Git repository, but they, I haven't checked them in. So if I do git add uh, star.yaml, I mean, they told me to apply all of these to my cluster. Um, uh, I, I could just do that. You could have applied. That's kind of boring, and I prefer to check everything in before I do it, before I run it even. Commit everything, push everything, and keep the whole history of your, of your experiments, right? So um, git commit, uh, add all the things, boom, git push. So I'm going to push this to a repository, uh, which is under my account. Let me find that. I think it was called, um, yeah, it was something to do with TensorFlow. Yeah, it's this one. I can see this commit showing up here, and it just adds all those manifests. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things there. Uh, I might review these changes later. I swear, I will. Um, and now if I go back to deploy, I can see that I've got a few things here being recognized, but I haven't got those things. So they, we currently poll every five minutes. Um, we're looking to implement uh, GitHub hooks and uh, whatever GitLab has, whatever Bitbucket has. Um, so an hour ago, we, we did a sync, and there was something there. And now we, we're going to see some more changes coming our way. We might have to wait, well, probably less than five minutes by now. Um, in the meantime, I can go to explore, uh, find the... Uh, go to cube system. Uh, find the, the the deploy pod, the deploy agent. It's called Flux. Uh, it is it maps to an open source project. Uh, so uh, you would find it here. And uh, if you if you jump into the not the memcached, the uh, but the if cloud agent pod. Uh, you should see the logs. So it looks like it started applying these things. If I go back to deploy, he hasn't done it yet, but I should see things coming up on my cluster. So if I disable the cube system namespace and I look at pods, okay, yeah, that, that was too soon, okay. So uh, we can wait a little longer. In the meantime, I could take some questions if people have some questions. That, do people online have questions? Okay. This will be recorded. They can watch later. Um, folks in the room have any questions? What you've seen so far? Maybe about the previous talk. Maybe I didn't show anything as exciting. Right. I, I, I think this, this is a more general question about um, what Viv Cloud is, really, right? So um, let me go back um, and try and explain it a little better. So um, what Viv Cloud is, is um, a set of tools as a service with a user interface uh, that 
help you operate and manage applications running in a cloud native environment such as Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes. So uh, you, you create a Cloud Foundry cluster as we saw earlier or a Kubernetes cluster and you deploy vCloud agents into that cluster uh, and then, then you get this UI. Uh, essentially, all you need to do is, well, you really don't need to do anything special other than install the agents. After that, you just carry on using the platform and you use vCloud to, to help you using that platform. So what, all you kind of really need to do is, you know, carry on using, using the platform you're using, which uh, some of the platforms to support uh, Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes, but we also support Docker Swarm and, uh, uh, Mesos and uh, some of the other container orchestrators. Did that answer the question? Yeah. Cool. All right, great. So, and, and as we saw earlier, we, you, you can provide extra integrations like uh, the plugins uh, we have for Cloud Foundry, and uh, you could potentially create some Prometheus exporters, which is a whole different topic. So, if you had some custom metrics from a whole black box type system, you could write a Prometheus exporter to export those metrics into the Cloud. Do you have another question over there? Cool. All right. So let's take a good look again. Um, so this clearly must have taken us more than, yeah, we've got more parts here. Okay. So disable cube system again. Now we, no. Uh, now we definitely are looking only at cube system, delete whatever we got in search. All right. So uh, we've got a whole bunch of things here. Um, so we've got um, Grafana running here hooked up to uh, InfluxDB, uh, it seems. I can, I'm not sure whether that, where that is, but, but some of the, the key bits here are, for example, the Selden server is, um, uh, is, is kind of key part of this uh, TensorFlow distribution I'm using. It also comes with like um, a, um, a few Kafka components, memcached, and uh, Selden controller, Redis, MySQL, um, Etc. But looking at these, we can see rather verbose names here, right? So if we go to controllers instead, we, we will see shorter names, which manage uh, of controllers which manage multiple parts on Kubernetes. Uh, similarly, like what we saw for Cloud Foundry. Um, cool. So, and now uh, you know we saw these things come up in the background. Perhaps we could consider uh, looking at what that process involved. If I go back to um, just at the start of the meetup, I've had nothing here. And then, yeah, I had nothing until I started my talk. It's only more recently that, that I started seeing some stuff here. Um, and then, yeah, I can essentially move. Um, no, this is. So let's go back to live. I'm just going to go time travel again and just move the. Uh, uh, I can edit the box here, actually. So 1912, let's look at 1905. Oh, nothing at that time. Okay. Well, this is really a kind of big feature we just released. Uh, so, uh, I'd, I'd like to have a look inside around the, the real use case. This is, this is just interesting to see some um, for me that's more. I'll have to do something about it. I'll have to make it a little bit slower too. Um, you may need to do with the, uh, the way we do something like that. But, uh, essentially, we, we can go back and see. But there was nothing in the system, but we could also just uh, add like, you know, just, just, just before, well, actually at six o'clock I had some stuff running. And then later I've deleted all of those things. But if I do go back to sometime earlier, I can uh, observe various changes going on. Like a while ago, there was nothing again. So clearly somebody has been deploying things to this part of making them and deploying them again. And some of that history is um, it surfaced and deployed. If I refresh this. Well, 
we can see um, various things here, right? So we can see what's been deployed in the last batch. And uh, an hour ago, um, there are some more changes. A, little, um, a day ago, there was some change here. Let's take a look what that was. All right, so we, in the, this particular change, we just went in the repository and updated the images we got, right? I could actually do that from the UI too. See so if I go back to, if I look at one of these, I can see I'm running um, Zookeeper image 1.0 from a year ago. That's probably a custom tag and on the upstream tag. Uh, but the upstream tag pointed to a year ago is uh, 348. Let's take a look at something a bit more interesting. Uh, maybe uh, Southern Server has seen a lot of changes. Yeah, so here I can see all the tags that there are in the, in the registry, which in this case is Docker IO, Docker Hub, default registry for most uh, Docker installations. Um, we can see all the, um, all the image tags there are for Southern Server. And it could go and deploy any of these if I'd like. And uh, if, if I do that, well, if I click on this, uh, here, is, here is the information what would happen. So this service, uh, the, the manifest for these particular services won't be uh, touched, but, but only the, um, won't be affected. Uh, and, but only the default uh, Selden server will be affected. That means the uh, uh, deployment named Selden server that leaves in default namespace. And uh, this particular change would, would just update the image tag. Anyway. Yes, Tama. Yes, well, we are over time. So. Okay, well, thanks everyone. <laughs> so thank you. So if this is your first time joining a Weave group, then um, please, I think if you come just through Meetup, um, you're not on our email list, so you are welcome to just email me directly. When the marketing folks send stuff out from community, it all comes from me anyway, so you will get my email address. But please, um, contact us, and otherwise, if you haven't already joined our community Slack channel, this is um, the way that you can invite yourself. Um, and this is the Weave user group, as I mentioned. So if you haven't joined yet, um, if you found out about us through different means, then please join us on the Meetup group. So we have the online Meetup group, which is this one, and then we have a few for different cities for London, San Francisco, Bay Area, um, New York, and Berlin where we have our primary location. So thanks again for coming, and thanks to our speakers. Applause. <laughs> and thank you for your um, hangout and ask us questions. So thanks again. Bye-bye.